I'm going to call this unclassified nomination hearing to, to order. Uh, welcome Brad Wigman, uh, President Biden's nominee to be the general counsel for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And I want to welcome to your family. I had a chance to meet your wife, Teresa, along with your kids, Nicole and, and Nat. Um, you look um, intensely focused already. Matt. Uh, and, and your mother, Carol. Um, I'd like to extend my appreciation to each of you because as somebody who's been in public service, the family has to make sacrifices as well. And I'm grateful that you're all here showing support um, for your, your son, husband, and dad. Um, I, I have to tell you, I was going to be very supportive, but I was told that you actually part-time write the crossword puzzles for the New York Times. That's right, Senator. As somebody who's never been able to finish one of them, I, um, I, I may hold. I won't hold that against you in this nomination here. Well, s sadly, if I give the, get this job, I have to give up that career. All right, because right, it's ethics rules. So uh, the, the one good thing, though, is crosswords for that me. We'll, we'll balance that out. Yeah. Is I knew clearly a conflict. You know, is that you were born and grew up in Richmond. That's right. I'm and, a Richmond native. Um, uh, your mom reminded me that she actually worked for a while in the General Assembly when I had That's right. a previous job. So it, uh, that will more than outdo the, um, <laughs> the crossword puzzle, please. I want to congratulate you on your nomination. You obviously have a distinguished record as a nonpartisan career servant in the field of national security. While you currently serve as senior advisor at the ODI, I know you've also served as principal deputy assistant attorney general at DOJ, as assistant legal advisor at Department of State, as Deputy Legal Advisor at the National Security Council under President Bush, and as a law clerk for Judge Patrick E. Higginbotham of the Fifth Circuit. I highlight all this because the issues in which you will wrestle of intelligence, national security, and the law must remain free from partisan politics. You and thousands of dedicated public servants, both in and out of the intelligence community, have chosen to dedicate yourselves to work tirelessly on the behalf of the people of the United States. For that, I thank you and countless than the countless other men and women who give the best in themselves as public service. As you know, the General Counsel of the ODI is the intelligence community's top lawyer. This position carries with it the responsibility of making some tough calls, especially in today's increasingly complicated security environment. One perfect example is the debate that many of us on this dais had recently during the 702 reauthorization about how we can continue to preserve this critical tool for Americans' ability to spy on foreign adversaries while still preserving America's civil liberties and particularly in the field of evolving technology, tech, tech, um, telecommunications technologies. At the end of the day, our intelligence professionals will often turn to you for guidance on what they can do and more importantly, what they cannot do. To do this, you will need your judgment and ethical compass to make the right decisions, even in the face of political policy pressure. In recent years, we have seen patriotic individuals come forward as whistleblowers who've then been sidelined, fired, or even retaliated against. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how you will work to ensure that such icy whistleblowers are going to be protected regardless of who's in the White House. More broadly, we have seen what happens when the expertise and judgment of America's civil servants and intelligent professionals are discounted, belittled, and outright ignored. When honest analysis is not welcomed by policymakers, regardless of party, the result is often bad policy based on faulty analysis. I'd also like to hear your thoughts on how we will work to continue to install the utmost level of integrity in the IC workforce and ensure that they continue to be able to speak truth to power, no matter, again, who's in the White House or, for that matter, who's in the DNI seat. Should you be confirmed, fulfilling this committee's oversight obligations will require trans transparency and responsiveness, and we'll expect you constantly deal with us in an honest, complete, and a timely fashion. We also, though, encourage you to come to the committee when partnership is needed. You'll always count on us to hear you out, treat you fairly, and usually without partisanship, you may see it elsewhere. Now, after the vice chairman and I give our, and I've given my opening statements, um, members will be uh, given five minutes in order of seniority. This is not this is the one time we in the open hearings do seniority rather than who gets here at the gavel. And before I turn it over to the vice chairman, I would like to submit for the record um, a letter of endorsement from a whole series of, um, of intelligence and legal uh, professionals from Bush, Obama, Trump, 
et cetera, um, for the record in support of Mr. Wigman. Without objection, so ordered. Um, with that, I'll turn to the Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wigman, to you, to your family. Congratulations on your nomination. Thank you for your willingness to continue to serve since you've been serving in various capacities for a number of years. Um, I think it's Wigman. Yeah. Okay. The, um, the work of intelligence is probably unique in all of our government. It is the one place where the American people basically say and admit our government needs to collect secrets and keep them secret. Not so much because they don't want us to know, but because if they divulge those secrets or they would divulge how they acquired it, they would divulge who gave it to them, and they would not be able to collect anything in the future. And the, but it's an extraordinary power given the technical advances today. Uh, we don't just operate in the realm of, of human intelligence. We operate in the realm of technical intelligence and the analysis of all kinds of things that are out there in the open in the media. Suffice it to say, the power that we now have deployed in the pursuit of in, foreign secrets that apply to our national security is an extraordinary power. And the only way that that bargain with the American people works is if they trust that that power will be used in three ways. The first, in a, in a way that the information is as accurate as possible. Sometimes it's analysis, and analysis can be wrong, but there's a difference between analysis that's wrong, because the analysis just made a wrong guess, uh, an educated guess, and the other trust they have to have, and that is they have to have the trust that it's not being manipulated, that someone is not going in and saying, I am going to either analyze intelligence or I'm going to manipulate the intelligence that we pay attention to in order to support a policy outcome that a policymaker may want or that may be popular. And the third trust is that it's not being weaponized, that it's not being used as a tool to target, for example, domestic political um, opponents. Uh, you made reference, uh, I believe you'll make reference, in your, certainly in your written comments at the opening about the church committee, which is ultimately what gave rise to the existence of this very committee, and, that all, it, and it unraveled and disclosed and um, revealed and uncovered all kinds of operations within the intelligence communities that almost destroyed our intelligence agencies in this country. Um, and part of that was that there were administrations in both political parties that had used our intelligence agencies to conduct either domestic political activities or to interfere in certain domestic political activities. So suffice it to say that this has been going on for a while, but it was the reason why this committee was created. Hence the role of general counsel, which should be, especially now that the DNI didn't exist back in the day, it acts as the conductor, the DNI that is basically the conductor of the orchestra. And it's a tough orchestra. Um, some of the instruments in that orchestra are bigger and more powerful than others. For example, the CIA. But it, it's an incredibly important role in that regard. And I also think, and I've mentioned this to you in our meeting, although I'm not sure it's within your purview, I, I do, one of the things that most disturbs me is when I go out and people say, and it bothers me because of what it implies to the trust that I raised, people will say to me, uh, you know, S the CIA or the intelligence agencies interfered in this or did that. And I remind people that often, most of the time, what they're referring to are former officials who have left the service of our country and then used that title as credibility when they make statements that may have political purposes and, and, and in some cases do have political purposes behind them. There's not much you can do about it, but it has eroded trust in our intelligence agencies. And I fear what that means because we do face a lot of threats in this country, to our country, to our national security. And the day cannot come, I hope the day never comes, where when a real stark warning is made about some threat to our country, that people don't just dismiss it because they don't believe who it is that's telling them. And so that is why it's so critical that above everything else, we always, people can always have, we can preserve and build the confidence that people can have in our agencies that the work they're doing is about our national security, not a tool for internal uh, politics, not as a way to spy and abuse on Americans. It's one of the resistances we have to the reauthorization of 702 is people are convinced it's being used to target Americans. And... Um, and not uh, because they think the information that's being provided to policymakers or to the public is selectively chosen to further one narrative or one political viewpoint versus another. And so I do think that to the extent as a general counsel, uh, you will be in a role to sort of see how agencies conduct their activities, what they're allowed to do, what they're permitted to do under the law that will also keep in mind not just what the law allows, but what the spirit of that law should be about and that you will, as I know the chairman will ask you, the routine questions we always do, but that you'll always be cooperative and responsive with this committee because we are, and our House counterparts are literally, the only eyes and ears the American public has between them 
and the secrets our government holds. And for us to be able to do our job effectively and with confidence, uh, we need to have that level of cooperation. So thank you for your willingness to serve, and we look forward to your testimony and your answers. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. And now will the witness please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to give this committee the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please be seated. Um, before we move to your opening statement, the Vice Chairman made reference to this. We've got five standard questions. They are routine, but they are critically important for the record and in terms of the commitment uh, you will make in, in your answers. Um, they just require a simple yes or no, uh, and again, for the record. First, do you agree to appear before the committee here or in other venues when invited? Yes. I think, have you got your mic on? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Number two. If confirmed, do you agree to send officials from your office to appear before the committee and designated staff when invited? Yes. Do you agree to provide documents or any other materials requested by the committee in order for it to carry out its oversight and legislative responsibilities? Yes. Will you ensure that your office and your staff provide such materials to the committee when requested? Yes. Do you agree to inform, inform and fully brief to the fullest extent possible all members of this committee of intelligence activities and covert actions rather than only the chairman and the vice chairman? Yes. Thank you very much. We'll now proceed to your opening statements, which again, I'll then recognize members by seniority for up to five minutes each. Mr. Reagan. Thank you. <clears throat> chairman Warner, Vice Chairman Rubio, members of the committee, thank you for having this hearing today to consider my nomination. I want to thank President Biden and Director Haynes for giving me this opportunity as well. I'd also like to thank my family who are here with me today, my mom, Carol, my wife, Teresa, my kids, Nicole and Nat, whose love and support mean so much to me. I'd also like to recognize my dad, who we all miss very much, but who's with us in spirit. So exactly 40 years ago this week, I was graduating from high school. It was 1984. And so like thousands of other students that year who were perhaps lacking in imagination, I had written a college application essay on Orwell's famous novel. I don't remember much about that essay, but it was something about the benefits and risks of modern technology and what the prospects were for an authoritarian surveillance state. I was just 17, and so I expressed great optimism that the human spirit would prevent Orwell's vision from being realized. Now, as fate would have it, about a dozen years later, I wound up becoming a national security lawyer for the federal government. And over the last 30 years, I've worked at the Pentagon, on the NSC staff, at the Department of State, and the National Security Division at the Department of Justice. Many of the issues I've worked on have to do in some way with that same subject as that essay. Technology and its benefits and risks, whether in the hands of our government, the private sector, adversary nations, or criminal groups. Figuring out how the law should address issues at the intersection of technology and national security is a huge challenge, and one that's important for the ODNI General Counsel and for this committee. Since 1984, technological advances have catapulted forward at an incredible speed. They've raised many tough, but by now familiar issues for national security policy and law. How should the IC protect privacy and civil liberties regarding vast quantities of data that are now commercially available to anyone? And how do we prevent foreign adversaries from exploiting the same data of US persons? How should the law address the challenges that encryption poses for law enforcement and intelligence while preserving privacy and cybersecurity? And how should the law regulate the government's use of artificial intelligence in ways that support national security while ensuring it will not be misused? And how do we defend against our adversaries' use of AI? These questions are just the tip of the iceberg. Gene editing, quantum computing, autonomous drones, synthetic media, and many other advances also present novel questions. So in wrestling with these issues, one of the challenges for lawyers is that the law often doesn't keep pace with the changing technological and threat landscape. Traditional sources of law often don't provide clear answers, so national security law in this area is messy. The policy implications can be major. No one wants a government that operates like Big Brother. And you don't have to read dystopian novels to be worried about this risk. As the chairman and vice chairman alluded to, you can just read the church committee report. At the same time, we all want a government that's effective at preventing us from an, uh, uh, protecting us from an array of very serious threats, threats which this committee knows very well. Our commitment to liberty will be hollow if we can't rise to meet the challenges posed by authoritarian regimes like China and Russia and terrorists and criminals and others bent on wreaking havoc around the world. So national security law plays a major role in reconciling these objectives. It both empowers us and constrains us as we make decisions that affect the security and freedoms of the American people. 
In my career, I've been privileged to work with hundreds of dedicated lawyers and policymakers in the executive branch to help our government both follow the law and adapt it to meet new challenges. If I'm confirmed, I hope to help the intelligence community continue to perform its vital mission in a way that is fully consistent with our Constitution and laws, as well as our values. Unfortunately, I'm not 17 anymore, but I'm still optimistic that the human spirit and critically our legal institutions will allow us to continue to thrive as a society that's both free and secure. I also strongly believe in the value of public service. Promoting greater public confidence in our law enforcement and intelligence agencies is a crucial objective today when such confidence appears to be eroding. If I'm confirmed, I look forward to working closely with this committee, which has a uniquely important role to play in overseeing the executive branch and thus helping us promote that confidence. Thanks again for having this hearing, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Wigman. And again, for, for members and, and staff, uh, if you want to submit questions for the record after the hearing, please do so by 5 p.m. on Friday, June 7th. Let me get at it. Um, many of us on this committee have worked on a topic that, uh, candidly, before I got on the committee, I didn't think I'd be spending as much time on, which is classification reform. Um, in your response to the questions uh, the committee put forward, um, you pointed out, I think, some of the harms from overclassification and what that does to, as Senator Rubio mentioned, we lose the public trust, uh, the value of not only our committee, but frankly, of the IC's work is greatly um, undermined. You acknowledge that a White House-led White House -led process that is currently underway um, is one way. One of the things we have, uh, have argued, some of us have argued, that the rules governing classification and declassification um, must be also dealt with by Congress, although at the end of the day, the President does have uh, an ability to do some of this on executive order. Um, do you believe that Congress has a role in establishing the rules that govern classification and declassification of information? Yes, yeah, so thank you for that question. So as you alluded to, I know the DNI and I both share the concern about overclassification. And as you said, there is a process underway to work on to try to address that problem. It's been a longstanding problem, though, an intractable problem for as long as I've been in government. Um, you can just look back at the old. There's a, there's a law passed in 2010, I know, about the Overclassification Act that Congress uh, passed at that time, and it goes back farther than that. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, I do think that historically, as you know, the basis, the underlying legal basis for classification has laid with the executive. Um, the series of executive orders that pres successive presidents have issued governing classification. Um, and that has a constitutional basis underlying it because of the president's role as commander in chief um, and chief executive. But I don't think that that means that Congress has no role. There's a number of uh, places where uh, Congress has legislated in this area, um, including the Atomic Energy Act, including um, FOIA, for example, where exemption B1 talks about how, um, when the government can withhold information, and that's an area that um, Congress has spoken to on classification. There's a number of other laws where Congress has directed specific declassification reviews. Congress created the Public Interest Declassification Board. So I think there's a lot of examples and space for Congress to assist the executive in dealing with the overclassification but problem. I would just hope um, we took another crack at this in the Intel Authorization Bill in 2025 that I think, again, had huge broad bipartisan support. Uh, before you formally become a Senate-confirmed member of the executive branch, uh -huh. uh, I'd like to have your commitment to continue to work with the committee on this legislation uh, rather than simply, when confirmed, oppose it for separation of powers reasons. Absolutely. We'll, we'll work with you on it. Okay, great. Thank you. Next question. I mean, one of the things the committee has has um, really taken on, both in a closed hearing, and we'll, so, we'll shortly be doing it on an open hearing, uh, the question of foreign malign influence. Uh, I believe very strongly that um, uh, it is appropriate and um, responsible to have communications between the intel community and the social media platforms on a voluntary basis focused on foreign malign influence. This is not anybody's ability to limit First Amendment rights. We're talking about foreign interference. This, this committee has spent an awful lot of time on that. Um, what are your views on the appropriate role that government officials should play in engaging uh, voluntarily with social media platforms and other technology companies to make sure that we are able to monitor and, if need be, report and inform the American public about foreign malign influence. Yeah, so um, I think this is an area that it's important for the government to act. The key is what you had just said, Senator Warner, which is that we can't coerce um, companies to remove First Amendment protected 
content. We can't be in the position of um, censoring uh, First Amendment protected speech online. But that doesn't mean that we can't engage with the companies when we see foreign governments or others engaging in malign conduct on social media platforms. And so I know the FBI has a program to be able to flag uh, accounts that we think are used by um, uh, our adversary governments to engage in foreign malign influence activities, as long as they're making clear to the company that what action, if any, they choose to take with respect to those accounts is strictly voluntary, and it's their choice as to whether to do anything about it, then I think it, that is an important uh, dialogue to have between the executive branch and the companies, and it's one that we've engaged in for a number of years, not only in the foreign malign influence context, but also for terrorism and, and other, uh, other ills as, uh, as well. So yes, I think it's an important activity. My last question is this way. As you, you know, we just had a spirited debate about Section 702 reauthorization. I was proud to have it reauthorized and appreciate um, committee members who support us, but also co committee members who opposed, who, who raised some of the past problems we've had with compliance. Um, we're only two months in, but uh, since we only got a two-year reauthorization, um, it's, it's not that far in the future that we will have to um, go through the reauthorization process again. Uh, one of the reasons I think there was pushback was we didn't do as good a job after the prior reauthorization on making sure compliance. Do you commit that you, will, if confirmed, that you will make 702 compliance one of your top priorities? Absolutely, I mean, we're, we're viewing this as, uh, some of us joke in the executive branch about continuous uh, reauthorization, in other words, because we, we're, we're, we don't want to take apart the, the, the good work that we've done over the last couple of years, uh, both in uh, persuading people the value of 702 collection, but also in working to ensure that we're on the top of our game for compliance purposes. And so we're gonna keep the mechanisms that I have in place uh, to keep doing that and, and wanna keep working with the committee and, and to report to you all as we go along about how it's going. Well, thank you, Mr. Wickham. Thank you for your service and I look forward to hearing the rest of your answers. Thank you. Senator Rubio. Uh, you were in the DOJ's National Security Division when the China initiative was dissolved in 2022. And yes, I sir. think you indicated that you would you were not involved in the decision to terminate the initiative, but you likely participated in discussions explaining the rationale for the decision. What was the rationale? The rationale was that essentially the, the problems that China posed were not unique to China. They were uh, the blind activities that China engages in um, are also engaged in by Iran, Russia, in terms of the theft of technology, the um, malicious cyber activity, the transnational repression, those are all activities that a number of nation states engage in. And so rather than have something focused only on China, we wanted to broaden the focus to a number of different uh, countries, but it was intended in no way, no way to signal a lack of resolve uh, towards continuing to pursue uh, investigations of uh, malicious uh, Chinese activity. And I think if you look at the, the FBI and DOJ's record since that time, they, they, they've continued to pursue um, uh, bad actors in China with the same uh, same zeal. So the, the rationale was that all the things that China does that are a threat to national interest and national security of the United States are also activities undertaken by other adversaries? That's right. And therefore we should just have a big bucket that that doesn't distinguish by country, but by activity. That's right. We gen generally speaking, we haven't uh, most often had programs focused only on specific countries. Do, do you recall in those conversations, and you don't have to tell us who it was, anybody mentioning that the scale, scope uh, of Chinese efforts on multiple fronts dwarfs that of any other actor? For example, the, the, es the commercial espionage conducted by the Chinese has no precedent among any other nation state power. I, I don't disagree uh, with that. I think China's the number one CI threat, absolutely. And, um, and, and certainly their uh, ability to in, in use supposedly private companies to sort of act as cutouts for the government of China, be they running a port or uh, provide telecommunication services. I mean, there, there is no Russian Huawei. There is no Iranian ZTE. Uh, do you recall anybody making those points in that discussion that the, the Chinese threat is quite unique in both its scale and, and reach? I don't remember that. I mean, I do know that, for example, Russia, we have had a number of cases. Uh, there's a the new task force set up uh, since the China Initiative uh, name was changed about um, disruptive technology theft. And certainly there have been a lot of cases of Russia um, stealing technology to uh, military technology to advance its uh, its efforts in Ukraine. So I think there is there is some of other countries, but I, I don't disagree with you that China is number one. All right. Um, the other question that I had is, is um You've been de on detail to the general counsel's office to ODNI since April, right? And uh, you're also nominated to be um, for, to this position on the 18th. So what, when did you start the detail position? April 1st. Okay. 
And, and what have, um, I assume, when you went over, you had some inkling that you would be nominated to this post. So it almost sounds like some yes, transitionary sir. phase. What, um, and, and would you, and I think just reading your biography, but I just want to hear it from you, it would be accurate to characterize all of your prior positions in government including in the de Department of Justice's career positions rather than political positions. That's right. Okay. So your current title in detail to se a senior advisor in the office of the general counsel. So w what exactly, not a trick question or a hostile one, I'm just kidding, mm -hmm. what exactly does the senior advisor, uh, will, there, will you have a replacement? Will any, or, No, or this is just a, placeholder? there's not much uh, in the title. Excuse me, sorry. Um, That's, that was behind you there. Oh, okay, great. Um, there's uh, there's not much to that title. I'm just I'm just doing um, essentially special projects as assigned by the general counsel and the DNI. On Are there any of those? Issues. Just give us a general understanding of what work yeah, you what do kind of things I'm doing. Yeah. So, for example, um, as Senator Warner referred to, we, you, you all just gave us the 702 reauthorization. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to implement that, uh, including some of the kind of new operational authorities that we have. That's one of the projects that I've worked on. Um, another is the DNI has an initiative um, focused on kind of harmonizing the pre-publication review process, if you know what that is, the um, process whereby former government officials have to come in and if they're going to write something, write an article or give a speech or whatever, they have to have it reviewed for classification and the different agencies have different standards and so forth. And so there's an effort to come up with a new directive to govern that. So th those are c c examples of the types of things that I've been working on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Senator White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Wegman, I enjoyed our conversation a couple of days ago. It was very helpful. And I want to pick up, and I think we can do it quickly, on some of the questions I asked you with respect to gaps in FISA protection for law-abiding Americans. That's my concern. So current FISA law prohibits the intelligence community from collecting GPS information on Americans overseas without a warrant. Is there any reason why that protection should not be extended to Americans in the United States? Uh, no, Senator. As we talked about um, when we spoke, if, for example, under 704 of FISA, if that authority requires a warrant under 704 to obtain geolocation data for an American abroad, then if the government is also trying to compel a company to produce geolocation information in the United States, then that, that should also require a warrant, in my view. So... Following up on that, current FISA law would require a warrant to search an American's apartment overseas. But if that American visits the United States, it's not clear that those provisions apply. Is there any reason why a warrant shouldn't be required to search that American's apartment overseas, regardless of whether that Ameri where that American is at that moment? Yeah, so I agree with that as well. That is a, that is a gap, I think, in the law. The, we sometimes re refer to that as like the vacation home uh, gap. Um, but yes, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any objection in principle to um, requiring a warrant to search an American's home overseas for foreign but intelligence we're, purposes. We're, we're making good progress. Let me now go to this question of secret law. And my colleagues here have heard me describe this on a number of occasions. But, you know, I feel very strongly that sources and methods have got to be secret, and that has got to be a sacrosanct principle in the intelligence community. I think the laws have got to be public, and that means basically you ought to be able to sit in a coffee shop somewhere and read a public law, because that's what our system depends on, is people having knowledge of public uh, laws. And as you know, we had something that we Jewish people call a kerfuffle <laughs> with respect to some of the definitions in 702, because on its face, it could allow the government to force just about any American with access to a Wi-Fi or a cable to participate in warrantless surveillance. That, to me, is what it said on its face. Now, to me, this isn't how legislation should be written, and it adds to distrust. So. My question here is, would you agree that the public has a significant interest in knowing the boundaries, and I choose that word specifically, of these authorities? Yeah, so I couldn't agree with you more. I think in a democracy, it's important that our laws be transparent and public um, to the maximum extent possible. 
in the intelligence area, as you know, that can pose challenges <laughs> because our, the activities are secret. And so have the legal basis for those activities. We, we want that to be public to the maximum extent that we can, but there can be challenges in doing so while to, in order to protect the activities that we need to keep secret. So I think with the, respect to the specific issue that you're referring to, which is the revision in the most recent reform to the definition of electronic communications service provider, um, I think what we've tried to do, working with the committee and working with the chairman, is to make as much information as possible um, public about what that new definition is intended to mean. It's a narrow change in the law to really address a change in how the communications architecture has evolved since, uh, since ECBO was adopted in the, in the 90s. And it was in response to a very specific FISA court decision uh, that said that a particular type of company was beyond the jurisdiction of the law. And so we've done as much as possible, including with working with the chairman, to make clear that it was intended to be a very narrow technical fix. And my understanding is that in the, the draft Intel Authorization Act, we're going to go another step farther okay. to try to link so. that definition to that court decision in a way that will try to provide as much as we can, possibly while protecting the sources and methods, as you said, Senator, that we need to protect. Let, let me get to my last question. Because sure. Because I work closely with the chairman and the vice chairman. And I think we made some progress on the definition. Yes. But this is still, as you and I talk, this is a balancing yeah. act. So here's my question. Under the executive order that controls classification, the DNI is supposed to weigh whatever sensitivities might exist against the public interest in the information. Now, if you're confirmed, you're going to be advising the DNI. And I would like to know whether you believe that when it comes to public law, those specific words, the public has got a strong interest in knowing what it means. I absolutely think the public has a strong interest. I know the DNI also believes in transparency, um, so I, I certainly would, would advise her on that. But it, it is a, it is it can be challenging sometimes, uh, given the in interest in protecting our equities. There, there's there's no question it's going to be challenging. That's yeah. why I thought you were a smart guy at the beginning, and I appreciated mm -hmm. the questions. I just want to have somebody in that room yeah. who's going to understand the difference, and I think you do. And this is going to be an ongoing kind of process between you know sources and methods got to be secret and public law so people can sit in a coffee shop and figure out what in the world's going on back here i get it thank i understand you. thank you mr chairman thank you senator white senator rich has agreed to pass for the time and move to senator Cornyn. congratulations mr wigman on your uh, nomination thank you um and thank you for your service to our nation in uh, various capacities before this i want to talk to you a little bit about 702 since it's come up and uh, that you're intimately familiar with it as well as the operation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, unlike a traditional adversarial process, a criminal trial, for example, where you have a prosecution and defense, um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court largely operates on an ex parte basis, correct? That's right. And what does that mean? That means that the government is there, but there's no party on the other side. And that means that the target of a, uh, let's say, a warrant, uh, somebody overseas, um, or other interested party whose rights may be involved, um, they're not invited to present uh, an argument to the court that's decided in a what I would call a traditional adversarial process, right? That's right, although I would point out that that's the same in the criminal context. If you're doing a Title III right. wiretap or a search warrant, the, the, the other side doesn't uh, know about that in that context thank you, either. Thank so. you for pointing that out. Yes, this is standard operating procedure right. in the criminal courts where, where the government seeks a, a search warrant or, or a, a wiretap or something of that nature. Of course, those can be reviewed on appeal that's in right. the event of a conviction. Right. But um, as you know, the current law on the uh, amicus curiae, friend of the court, Yes. Um, allows the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to consult with an amicus on novel questions of law. Um, that is a process where the court initiates it, asks the amicus, would you care to weigh in to help us make a better decision? Is that what you understand to be the current, uh, current state of the law? Yes, that's right. And you're aware of the fact that there were discussions leading up to the last authorization, and in fact, those discussions can continue about a, uh, um, let's say, a, a, a more, um, an amicus role that is much more of the nature of an adversary as opposed to just a friend of the court. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I am. For example, in the, in the, uh, in the 
provisions that were not included but are now included in the uh, Intelligence Authorization Act, which is a public document, um, would allow the amicus to actually appeal uh, from some of the decisions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Is that right? Uh, I know that that's been proposed before. And, um, well, I would invite you to look at the look at the uh, what passed out of the committee on the Intelligence Authorization Act. I think you'll find that some of the proposals that were not included were now included, which provide for a uh, amicus role, which basically makes them a party uh, to litigation and enables them to uh, appeal uh, to an appellate court uh, the decisions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. But let me just ask you about the practical operation. Is frequently in intelligence operations, is there a need for speed? Yes, sir. And would the prospect of a protracted uh, litigation, including an appeal to an appellate court of decisions made by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that ordinarily would be made on an ex parte basis to allow those appeals to proceed and perhaps slow down the uh, collection of, uh, of uh, national security intelligence? Is that a concern of yours? Yes, it would be, sir. So years ago, uh, General Hayden, who was head of the National Security Agency and, of course, CIA director, wrote a book which I enjoyed quite a bit. But the title of it was called Playing to the Edge. And uh, of course, it's your job to say what the edge is mm. uh, to the people that you, you work for. Um, but unfortunately, we've also seen a political uh, consequence where intelligence officials play to the edge, that is based on sound legal advice given to them by people like you and others uh, in the int national security interest to try to get all the information they can legally get under the current authorities, and then uh, are later um, held to account, or I would say hung out to dry, by the political branches when, uh, when maybe it turns unpopular later on. Are you familiar with some of what I'm referring to? Yes, sir, unfortunately. And so um, what's your view of playing to the edge? So the, look, the, the appropriate way to play to the edge is a chief counsel for the director of national intelligence. So look, I see my job as a lawyer is, is providing my best view of the law. Um, sometimes there are gray areas, and when you can make legal arguments that you think are supportable, that's something that, that becomes a policy choice essentially for the, for the client to make. If, it's, if you have a, a, good, a good and defensible legal argument that people may disagree with, then uh, and if national security requires it, then that may be something that, you, that, you, uh, that they can have discretion to do. Um, so, but there are other cases where it's like, well, there's really not an argument here, and uh, you, you, while it might advance your interest, you, you may have to do it, or you may have to come back to this committee or Congress to get additional authorities or, or, or something different. So that's kind of how I see my job, is making clear when the law draws a red line and says that's just not something you could do, and when you have um, space to make a decision. Thank you. I want to follow up on that exact line of questioning. My note says, is your role as a facilitator or a watchdog? In other words, lawyers in their private practice want to tell their clients how to legally do what they want to do. Yeah. In this situation, it seems to me there's a little bit of a difference because you're in a secret agency and you're one of the only people watching whether your policy folks are following the law. Ruminate on that distinction for me. So I guess you could probably use a little bit of both of those terms. Uh, it's a little bit of both, and I have that in my current job. You're, you're both an oversight official uh, to make sure that they're following the law and doing what they need to do, but you're also trying to work creatively with your client to come up with solutions to the very real world problems that they have and the threats that we're trying to confront. The question is working, so, whether working creatively with your client yeah. facilitates illegal action. The no. classic example that this committee dealt with some years ago was the torture. Yeah. Uh, which was justified by, you'll pardon the expression, some pretty tortured legal opinions. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about that, that experience. So that's when your judgment comes in. You, you, you don't want to distort the law beyond uh, all recognition. Uh, you, you have to follow the law. In my experience, you want to collaborate with other lawyers. One of my concerns back then was that the, those decisions were made by a very small uh, number of lawyers, kind of in, in secret. Um, that wouldn't be my approach in general. We have groups of lawyers that get together. We have a, 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 something led by the National Security Council Legal Advisor. It's called the Lawyers Group. It includes lawyers from ODNI, from the Office of Legal Counsel at DOJ, 
uh, the chairman's legal, so the military lawyers, the State Department lawyers. You know, we get together to talk about hard issues in national security law, and usually these are some of the most experienced lawyers in the executive branch, and we come to kind of good conclusions about what the law is and what, what arguments we can make. And I, I feel like that's an effective process, but the key is that it's collaborative and you have a bunch of lawyers bringing the best minds together on an issue. Well, you're, you're, you're going into one of the most important positions in our government, and that is the legal advisor to the director of national intelligence. And the question is, are you willing to say no to the director of national intelligence or the president of the United States if they're intent on a policy that you believe is in conflict with the law? Absolutely. That's the right answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wigman, congrats again on your nomination. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, technology issues, and it's you know clear to me that advancements in tech you know drive our national security, including our intelligence capabilities, from the rapid advancement of AI and facial recognition and space-based systems, these technologies and the countries who excel at deploying them determine the security landscape that we're going to live in. And they're changing very quickly. Uh, you know, sometimes, I mean, a matter of weeks or months we see, today we see dramatic changes in technology. And I think a challenge that we face here in Congress is grappling with the ability to legislate effectively on a topic that requires a lot of technical expertise. Um, and sometimes this stuff is hard to understand. And I imagine that's similar in the legal profession. So can you share with us a little bit about how you overcome that kind of challenge when presented with some novel legal questions on emerging or evolving technologies? Yeah, so it can be challenging for lawyers. I mean, uh, certainly you're an engineer and astronaut. It's probably a lot easier for you uh, to uh, assess these issues than lawyers who sometimes really are wrestling with technologies that they don't understand. And so artificial intelligence is a, a good example of that, at least to me. It's a, it's a new technology, understanding how a large language model works um, and what the implications are for privacy and national security is, is difficult. Um, there are going to be questions, for example, that we're wrestling with right now um, under the attorney general guidelines that govern intelligence activities and how they would apply to the intelligence community's use of large language models and artificial intelligence. So generally speaking, in other words, the goal in the intelligence community is to try to minimize your collection of US person information and get as little information as possible consistent with your mission. A large language model is the opposite premise, right? You need to have as much information as possible to make that model effective and to have the answers that it produces be the correct ones. And so how are we gonna reconcile <laughs> those kind of opposing uh, impulses? And the way the guidelines are written right now, they don't take into account, they weren't written with artificial intelligence in mind. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to wrestle with that and maybe come up with different guidelines as to how that works. So we're, we see in the executive branch, similar to what the Congress would be facing, because we have our own rules and regulations that we set for the intelligence community as an executive branch matter and, and face many of the same challenges that, that this committee or others in Congress would confront. So it sounds like you've uh, had a little bit of experience in the, in the AI field that you can use here in your new role. Um, but what other policies and legal issues that you worked on at DOJ do you anticipate is going to be a continued focus in your job at, in the intelligence community? Um, well, I mentioned the, um, the 702 reauthorization, so that's one that we clearly will be working on closely with DOJ. Another big issue that I partnered closely with ODI on, I don't know how familiar the committee is with it, is the, um, the fallout from the European Court of Justice's uh, Schrems decision from a few years back. This was a decision that basically held that um, companies operating in Europe could not transfer data to the United States because of concern that our, that our surveillance laws whether those be FISA or under 12333, did not adequately protect European citizens' privacy. So we had to go back to the drawing board in terms of our laws, come up with a new executive order, which ended up, the President Biden ended up issuing EO 14086 to kind of provide new privacy protections, even included a new um, data privacy court 
that we established at DOJ to hear claims of European nationals who believe they're being unlawfully surveilled. So there's kind of a creative solution. It's gonna be an ongoing issue though, because I'm sure it's, it's being challenged already in the European courts again, and we're gonna have another round of litigation. And so that's an issue that I think ODNI is gonna to have to continue to work on. With the exception with, uh, of that DOJ. example, and maybe yeah. FISA, can you, um, do you have an example of maybe what you think another really challenging legal issue that the intelligence community is gonna face here going forward? Um, I think if I could flag um, counter narcotics, I know that's an area that the, the cons of deep concern to the Congress is the fentanyl and all the deaths that are resulting from fentanyl and other synthetic opiates in the United States. And I think it's an area that the IC has always worked in the counter narcotics space, but we're gonna be doing more in that space mm -hmm. and how to kind of merge uh, and, and have law enforcement and the IC work together uh, on the counter-narcotics threat in maybe ways that are similar to how we've dealt with the counterterrorism threat is, um, looks good on paper, but it's gonna be a challenge in practice um, to, to kind of translate some of those lessons that learned in the terrorism context over the counter-narcotics context. So I think that's one that's gonna be an ongoing project for a number of years. Well, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does any member wish to ask a second round? Well, Mr. Wigman, um, one, congratulations we got through this in you know, uh, 45 minutes. Two, I think you heard, particularly on 702, and one of the things I appreciate about this committee, members feel very strongly uh, and figuring out a way to, to get it right. And as you've heard from other colleagues, how we sort through things like AI is gonna be uh, enormously challenging. You know, I look forward to supporting your nomination. And I wanna again thank your family for, for being here and supporting you in this. And um, I will again, uh, uh, remind members if and for those members who are not here if they have questions for the record please get them in by five o'clock on friday Anything else we are adjourned thank you Senator.